Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, September 30th, 2024 video two of the day. All right, we're going to continue with the zombie apocalypse theme. Uh, you know, a couple little more things I just wanted to add to that was, uh, you know, if the duck stuff does hit the fan, more than ever, your word's going to matter. All right, people are going to have to know that they can trust you in your community. Because you're going to have to come together as a community more than anything. So when you state something, uh, you got to follow through with it. Otherwise, if you lose trust, the community isn't going to help you. And then you're, gonna, you're not going to survive on your own. You're going to need people around you to survive the zombie apocalypse, whatever it may be. And then, of course, you know, back in the day, you know, remember? Spit on your hand, shake hands. You don't have to spit on your hand, but I mean, even a handshake. That seals a deal. You're not going to have written contracts and lawyers and all that crap and be able to sue people and take them to court and all that. No, you're just going to have to. Anybody in the community that doesn't go along to get along needs to go. So that's I'm just telling you about the zombie apocalypse. All right. So I want you to watch today's episode of Redacted. I got some of this material from there. Uh, they were talking about, I didn't even know, there's a cell phone outage across the United States. Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T are down all over the place. Uh, was it a cyber attack? We don't know. Uh, in fact, redacted. They said their phones aren't working. However, I called a buddy of mine who's on a beach in North Carolina. His phone works fine, mine works fine. So it's obviously not across the country, but it, it could be a huge cyber attack. Uh, the next thing was... Um, Wanted to get into uh, the Georgia plant fire. This is, uh, I'm just going to cover this briefly, but uh, if you want to watch the whole story, uh, Redacted has it. I just picked up a couple of videos. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. It's a chemical plant burning in Georgia. So I wanted to, I was trying to remember that chemical spill. When you remember when the train fell over in Ohio and, uh, and then, of course, the Biden administration told Ohio to, to go F themselves? Uh, While well, they're doing the same thing to Asheville, North Carolina, we're going to get into that story in just a minute. But I, I so I did a, a search on uh, chemical fires across the U.S. or whatever you whatever you want to search on, and or search on chemical spills. I came up with all these chemical spills. I was like, what the hell? I mean, chemical plants blowing up all across the United States. I was like, I didn't hear anything about this on the news. I mean, I'm a news hound, man. I, just do a search and duck, 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 go it. Don't Google it. Don't Google it. Google it. I hate to hear it. Every time somebody says Google it, I want to just touch them right in the nose. Don't Google anything. Duck, duck, go. Start page. Use the damn search engines that are going to give you unbiased research. All right. All right. Uh, gosh, Dan, I'm sorry. I just got pissed off. Uh, anyway, so yeah, chemical spills are all over the place. I was going like, well, I guess... I'll just talk about that. But here's the uh, the video. I got two videos on it. No, it's not good. All right, so that, that was the chemical spill, which just rolled through that story. The next huge story, because if you, if you recall my last video, if you didn't watch it, at the end I said, I, my prayers and thoughts are with the people of Asheville, North Carolina. Now, I had just watched videos of, like, you know, of the flooding. You know, and, and you see videos of flooding all the time, and you think, oh, wow, it looks pretty bad. I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that ain't my house. It's underwater right now, uh, you know. Oh man, they're saying this is worse than Katrina. More people have died. They're, we're in the we're in the thousands of casualties, if not dead, from this storm. I didn't know it was this severe. I had no freaking idea. And if you want the whole story, watch Redacted. But I mean, some things came out that I mean, I was just appalled. Uh, so the first thing um, was that Biden said, you know, it's just like with Hawaii, which is going to vote Democrat. doesn't make sense to me. Remember Maui with the fire and all the houses burned down? And then Biden gave them $700 a piece to replace their house? Yeah, that'll, that'll go a long way in uh, Hawaii. <laughs> it might buy you one meal. Uh, but anyway, and so that's all the help. And that's a Democrat state. 
And, and so I wonder, I don't understand why Democrats vote Democrat. I mean, when the federal government, when you're in power and it doesn't even take care of you as a Democrat, I, it, it just makes no sense to me, man. I, but the same thing's happening in Asheville. Biden said, we've given them all the help we're going to give them. And, uh, and so screw them. So Florida, Rohan, Rohan is coming to the aid. We will not let Gondor fall by themselves. But uh, anyway, so here's DeSantis on how Florida's going to send aid to Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, what I would say is the um, you know, Florida, we, we have it handled. We got approved for the individual assistance, things we've wanted. Uh, we, have, we have what we need. Now, obviously, uh, you know, there may be additional things that we'll ask for in the future. I, it depends on how things shake out. But uh, I think most of the effort should be in western North Carolina right now because you still have active rescues that need to take place. I mean, just think about, it's almost like if, if this area were totally cut off and every road was destroyed and all this, but you can still get places by boat. There, you can't do that. You're in, and I just think they should really, the, the federal government should focus on that. We're running rescue flights. Uh, we're happy to do it, uh, but I know the federal government has more assets than the state of Florida has, so there should not be anybody left behind in those communities. Uh, clearly, Florida residents who are still there, most of them uh, stay, if they stay you know, six months or less than six months, usually by October, uh, mid-October is when they start coming back. So a lot of them would want to come back anyways. So we have our Operation Blue Ridge. We are going to be doing that. We're going to be bringing people to safety. You know, if we have a smaller bird, you may not be able to take as many people. The Chinook, you know, what is that, 40 packs we can do? We could do 40 packs on a Chinook helicopter. So that may be just like maybe one whole neighborhood in these areas. And I know there's a lot of Floridians that, that go up there, but there's probably a lot of Floridians that have never been to those mountains. And what I will tell you is it's very pretty. Uh, it's very refreshing because there's no humidity, uh, but it is very ragged. I mean, they build these roads and, you know, it, it is not necessarily easy to get around all the time. Uh, it, it's not well lit all the time. You know, it's just a different, different lifestyle. And so when you have something like this happen to sever the roads and the bridges and a lot of the things that happen, I mean, basically... Uh, I don't think they have any major way to even get out of a lot of those Western North Carolina places right now. That's going to require uh, us doing the air mission. So that's why we're doing it. And um, we I know, Kevin, we've had people sign up already. Sure. Yeah. So so Kevin, his team are doing that. And, you know, you're going to see people be brought back uh, on our mission very, very shortly. And we're, we're happy to do it. I mean, look, if we can bring people back from Israel by the hundreds uh, when Hamas is raining rockets down, you know, we should be able to get some helos into uh, the, the Blue Ridge Mountains and, and get people out of there. But, yeah, I think that just from a response perspective, this here is very important. We're going to be there. But they didn't have any fatalities. I think in North Carolina, whatever fatalities have been reported, I think that's probably uh, just scratching the surface of what's possible if we don't get people in there and get them out to safety. And if you think about it, you know, it's like you, you could throw, uh, you know, throw me there for five days, whatever, food and water. But you have like a, a, a child with special needs. You have a senior that is power dependent. You have this stuff. You run out of time very quickly. And so I think this just looking at everything that I've seen in the information, I think that is where they need to make sure everybody is brought to safety. I mean, you know. As, as bad as it is to see a restaurant uh, hammered or see homes, you don't want loss of life. That is the one thing we can't rectify. You know, we can always rectify property. We can rectify infrastructure. You can't rectify the loss of life. And, um, you know, my fear is, is just having those areas cut off. Uh, it's a very difficult mission. So, so we're, in, we're in the mission. We're in the fight. We're going to be bringing people back to safety, and we'll keep doing that as, as long as it's necessary. All right, so that was DeSantis. I'm damn proud of him. I'm damn proud of Florida. You know, isn't it amazing that the Republicans help and the Democrats don't give a shit? <laughs> you know, it just blows my mind. All right, so that was, uh, and then so the, the couple other little factoids that came out of this was the truckers that are trying, trying to bring in uh, supplies. Now, whether that's just restocking a Walmart or they're actually going to the areas where the supplies are needed in eastern uh, Tennessee, their tires are getting slashed. 
who knows who's doing it? I guess they're, they're looking into it because when they pull into the truck stops and they go to sleep overnight, they come out and all the tires are slashed on the trucks. Who would do such a thing? So I, I, it's probably a CIA operation would be my guess. I mean, that's, that's how much I, I hate our government right now because they hate us. They can't stand Americans. And then the other story that came out that I was shocked was the Tennessee National Guard. Now, what do you think the Tennessee National Guard should be doing right now? Well, I would say I would mobilize them to help the people in uh, uh, eastern uh, North Carolina and to help the people in eastern Tennessee. Wouldn't that be what you would do with the National Guard? No, the Democrats are sending them to Israel. Who's in charge of the federal government? Is Israel in charge of our federal government? Sure does look that way. Sure does look that way. Uh, oh, I, this was a, I, I want to start with this. All right, so this was... A lot of people thought that when Netanyahu gave his speech at the UN, it was well received. Well, really, at the UN, all the seats were empty. But they had a, a I guess they have a gallery in the back, and the Israelis can invite whoever they want. Let's watch that video. So, here, a lot of cheerings when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is delivering his speech. May I know? Do you do you do you know where those those visitors are like coming the, from? The Israeli delegation, like any other delegation, is allowed to bring guests when their head of delegation speaks. So, that I mean, those are guests of the prime minister. But so here, a lot of okay. So that was that was Netanyahu. Now, before I get into the meat of the story, there's also another event taking place that you're not hearing about in the mainstream media and that is the longshoremen uh, um, dock workers are going on strike your shelves are going to be empty i tell you what if you get uh, today i think they're going on strike today if you don't get to the damn grocery store right away and get your damn groceries right now i i'm going to tell you that you know it's, uh, hopefully you're stocked up for like six months you know i i went yesterday uh, you need to get there right now because I'm telling you, if these guys go on strike, not only the price is going to go up, but the shelves are going to be empty. So get ready for that. And here's here's how much the federal government thinks of that strike. Where, where have you been kind of focused and hearing on what would happen if the strike goes, let's say, longer than a week? Uh, again, I, I have not been very focused on that. Where All right, so that was the, the, the head... Of, of the, the person that should be handling the strike and making sure that they don't go on strike. And you can tell it's not a priority for the Biden administration because they don't give a shit about the American people. Oh, my God. So now we've got, uh, so what's taking place, all right? I, di I didn't know who this dude was that they took out. I mean, I knew he was the head of Hezbollah, but, you know, I didn't know he was the Archduke Ferdinand uh, that's going to explode the world. And I'm telling you, man, it... it I'm watching, learning about who he is because I, I actually posted a post on X. I won't read it to you. I just said, uh, I don't know if he was an honorable person. I don't know if he was good or bad, but I put up a song to all the Muslims out there of, you know, angels, about angels. And because uh, anytime, uh, you know, well, not knowing whether he was a good dude or a bad dude, I just wanted to express my condolences because they put out, a, I called it an epitaph. It's not an epitaph. It was a eulogy. They put out a whole eulogy uh, about him. If you want to go to X, you can read the whole eulogy. It's on my feed. Um, and I said, man, I wish that somebody would put this up when I die. <laughs> of course, nobody's going to know when I die. Uh, but anyway, so this is the, so, so now there's an emergency uh, motorcade going on in Russia. Now, here's what I think happened. I'm just speculating, but I, I, there was Russians down in Iran, okay? And so I think Iran told them, uh, you know what, because Russia wanted Iran not to do anything until the BRICS conference in Russia that's going to take place in October, all right, very soon. But I think Iran said, hell no, we don't give a shit about BRICS no more. It's, t it's let's go to war. Let's go to war. And so, I, 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 so let's just watch that emergency motorcade.
So kind of looks like an emergency motorcade to me, didn't it? And so why is that motorcade happening? We don't know yet. I went to RT, couldn't get any information on it. Um, so, but the, uh, let's just keep going. So we did the UN walkout. Uh, all right, so now we're going to get into the meat of the video. Now, the first video I want to show you is to show you who this guy was, Alist Alistair Crook uh, from Judge Napolitano. He gives a great description of everything that took place and, and everything about it. And uh, I, you, I encourage you to go watch the whole episode on Judge Napolitano's channel, okay? But I just wanted to pull this bit out because I didn't know who this dude was. I didn't know a lot about everything that took place. I showed you the videos out of RT. Uh, let's watch that video. Was not lawfully, is not lawfully uh, at war. How does this strike you? Well, everything is focused, I mean, first of all, on Hassan Nasrallah himself and his death, and also the effect on Hezbollah, which I'll come to in just a second. But I think it's really important to underline uh, that um, Hassan Nasrallah uh, is a symbol um, far beyond Lebanon. It's not just confined to the, if you like, the Israeli-Lebanese um, arena. It is, there have been huge marches in Kashmir, in Pakistan, India, massive marches, as well as in the more usual places like Jordan and elsewhere and in, in, in Iraq. Because why? Because he, he was a symbol. He was a symbol for national liberation, for an end to colonialism. It, he was the symbol. He was, if you like, I mean, in a certain, in, in a certain way, um, you know, transcended it that to an extent that he was an icon for all the world in terms of uh, justice, justice for the Palestinians, but an end to, to the, to the, to the process. Uh, he was like a, 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 you know, a, oh well. Anyway. He, he is much more important than that. And of course now um, the region is boiling and it is this assassination has crystallized and brought to a head um, really something much bigger than just what's been happening in Lebanon. It's brought to a head this whole issue about uh, the new order. We're in the midst of a transition from one world order to another world order. Uh, and at the moment, there's uh, great celebrations going on in parts of America and Europe uh, and in Israel that this is sort of defined the new era and this is what will happen. But it's not going to be, it was such really uh, an assault on common humanity. More than a thousand Lebanese are dead uh, as a result. Uh, the were, there were six high-rise apartment buildings simply collapsed in, in that process of the assassination. There are a million, if you like, Lebanese displaced now because Israel is continuing the assault on Lebanon, continuing the assault on Beirut. People are moving. Many of them are sleeping out on the Esplanade. Uh, at the front of Be Beirut. And, and so he's um, something that has uh, symbolized something more. This is about, you know, humanity and about the idea of an end to, uh, end to colonialism and the end to hegemony imposed on, on a people. So I think it's a very powerful, it's a very important moment beyond just Lebanon. The, what has happened. Very important for Hezbollah too. Is this going to uh, unite the resistance against Israel? You mentioned you mentioned India and uh, Pakistan as well as the uh, usual places. And if it does unite the resistance, is it going to put pressure on governments like Jordan to do something? Uh, yes, it's certainly going to do this, but, you know, and there's a lot of 
celebratory noises coming out of various parts of the West at the moment that this is a new Western hegemony emerging. But I, as I say, we're at a transition in the world order, uh, and we've seen a huge shift of support away from the West um, during this period and to BRICS. I mean, we're seeing the tectonic plates of the world are, are shifting. And I think it's very doubtful, very doubtful that the West can, the Western ruling strata can reestablish, if you like, um, a new hegemony uh, on the basis of genocide uh, and bombing of civilian areas um, and, um, uh, uh, and assassinations, which is the basis of it. It just is such an affront to all humanity that I can't see that you, they can lever up a new, if you like, hegemony uh, on that basis. But of course, at the moment, they are full of um, excitement as what's happening and planning, and in Israel, planning um, a big extension of this to take it, if you like, into what they call the new regional order, the new Middle East order, as tell, Netanyahu calls it. Tell us a little bit about Nasrallah. Was he just the, the face uh, of Hezbollah? Was he just a spokesperson or was he a sub substantial figure like uh, Gandhi or Nelson Mandela? He was the latter. He was a substantial. This is why you have people, in, as I say, in Kashmir and Pakistan and everyone um, on marches because he had that charisma. He was, if you like, albeit uh, in, in, a, in a militant way, he was a Gandhi. He was someone that created this huge charisma. People, you see signs, signs of people crying and mourning him across the world. So he was something very much more than just the leader of, of, of Hezbollah, but he was also a military leader and he was a teacher. And so he brought, um, if you like, moral teaching um, to the people. And he was a symbol of a, a lack of corruption and a commitment to justice. Okay, so that was Alistair Crook. And I hate taking so much material from other people, but George Galloway, I'm going to tell you, the guy is like, he's Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's the greatest orator I've ever heard. And so he was talking about the whole thing of what's taking place in the Middle East. By the way, the special forces of, um, of the, uh, Israel have crossed into Lebanon. Uh, they're scouting things out. I think there's uh, fighting taking place right now. I'm not sure when, but it looks like they're saying tonight the main force is going to be coming across. I say tonight because I'm making the video now. It's about 7 o'clock. Uh, by the time this video gets posted, uh, I imagine it's going to be full-scale war in, in Lebanon. Uh, but let's watch uh, George Galloway on uh, what took place. Israel is bombing four Arab countries right now, but the United States says it's struggling to stop a wider regional war. Is Hezbollah defeated following a cataclysmic series of disastrous security blunders and the decapitation of many of the military leaders of the Lebanese resistance group, a hundred thousand strong, culminating, of course, in the assassination deep underground of the leader Said Hassan Nasrallah, no ordinary leader. Israel is reportedly about to enter and cross the border of Lebanon, making a ground invasion for the first time since 2006. Will they regret this precipitate decision? Will they regret this series of events which has left the whole world on the edge of a regional war which could easily become an international conflagration? It was murder most foul, not the killing of Hassan Nasrallah. I'll come to that in a minute. It's a war between Israel and the Lebanese resistance, and you must expect that leaders eventually will be targeted. Although I caution that that is a double-edged sword, and it may even be the case that Netanyahu himself was injured at the Ben-Gurion airport last evening on his touching down from New York. 
Certainly there have been no signs of life of Netanyahu since the Israeli press revealed that either the aircraft or his house appeared to have been struck all the way from Yemen by a ballistic missile attack. So what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. And if the Israeli state is really going to murder the heads of countries and organizations around the world, they must expect that they will receive the same in return. But the murder most foul was the six high-rise buildings that were reduced to dust and the huge number of civilian casualties that were regarded as mere collateral damage. A bit like an organization, I don't know, Hezbollah bringing the United Nations building down with every single person in it because Netanyahu was somewhere in the building again, about which more later. A bit like the British state destroying the Falls Road and killing everyone who lived there because a leader of the IRA had been suspected of being present on the street. You get my drift. The hundreds, now probably thousands, of Lebanese casualties over the last 72 hours is, of course, an all-out war. Don't be fooled when they say they're bombing Hezbollah. I remember I was in Beirut in 1982 when Israel invaded the country and how frustrated it felt to see reports that Israel was bombing PLO bases when I knew that they were bombing Palestinian refugee camps. The truth is, they are murdering Lebanese people. They are murdering Muslims, Sunni and Shia. They are murdering Christians. They are bombing the towns and villages in which Jesus walked, including amongst people who still speak the language of Jesus. The Christian world is entirely silent about all of that. Lebanon, a sovereign country, a member of the United Nations, every country in the world has an ambassador in Beirut. It's ordinarily a very nice posting. Are absolutely silent, doing nothing, saying nothing about the reduction, yet again, of an Arab capital city to dust, to ash. And the most silent of all are the other Arab countries in whose league, the Arabs have a league, in whose league Lebanon sits. The entire Muslim world is absolutely silent, struck, dumb, and powerless, paralyzed, can do nothing. After 12 months of wholesale slaughter of Palestinian children and women in Gaza, after decades of land grabbing, house demolition, the construction of illegal settlements, nobody is ready to take control of the violent attack dog known as the State of Israel. It is, as I've said before, a vindication of the thesis of my compatriot Mary Shelley, the writer of Dr. Frankenstein, that once you've made Frankenstein, you don't control Frankenstein, he controls you. The monster controls you, and the monster is in charge. There is no doubt at all that the United States is deeply complicit in what has been happening in Lebanon over the last 72 hours. Their, their aircraft carriers, their warships are just offshore to provide moral and later perhaps material and men uh, for the Israeli war effort in Lebanon. The president of the United States and the vice president and now presidential candidate Kamala Harris have fully supported the slaughter of the Lebanese. Good luck, Kamala Harris, in the state of Michigan come November the 5th. The United States, the European Union, all of the usual suspects who support the great crimes of Israel 
to a greater or lesser extent, to the nth degree, are all jointly and severally responsible for the massacres of the Lebanese people. If I seem emotional about this, well, Lebanon is where I came in. I first entered the Arab world, its culture, its religions, its uh, cuisine, its music, everything about it. I entered it through the portal of Lebanon. These Lebanese people are precious to me, and many, many of them are being slaughtered right now. The question is, was it a smart move by Israel? I see the usual suspects, either ISIS and Al-Qaeda supporters, including here in Britain, quite boldly, quite boldly, shooting the ISIS Al-Qaeda breeze on social media. No algorithmic strangling for them, no shadow banning for them, dancing on the grave of Hassan Nasrallah and his comrades in the leadership of the Lebanese resistance. Zionists, of course, celebrating, but they will not necessarily be celebrating for long. But the liberal intelligentsia are queuing up in the newspapers, in the columns, on social media to declare that Hezbollah is finished. Well, they're making, in my view, a very big mistake. First of all, although Nasrallah is no ordinary leader, he himself built up Hezbollah from a, a group of young men when I was in Lebanon in 1982, Hezbollah didn't exist. And uh, no one actually felt any political presence of the majority Shia community in Lebanon. They were out in the cold, had no political voice, no political strength, and definitely no military strength. Hassan Nasrallah changed all of that. He made that small group of young men of the Shia uh, sect of Islam, he made them into a mighty army. And they are still a mighty army. As residents all over Israel found out overnight, the idea that killing Nasrallah, killing 10 or 11 or 12 commanders who unaccountably, 10 of them, were in the same apartment when they were killed, there are deep-seated security blunders at the heart of all of this. It's not my business to advise. It's not even necessarily my business to discuss. But suffice to say, there are security lapses in the Lebanese resistance that one presumes will right now be being plugged. But the idea that killing these commanders meant that the men in the field were now powerless to strike I came to a rude end overnight where hundreds of missile, I mean ballistic missile, as well as the usual katyushas, as well as the usual drone strikes and so on, Israel was in flames overnight. The airport was hit. Netanyahu's house may have been hit. The towns that never had to run for the aircraft shelters are now this evening in the aircraft shelters. So, militarily speaking, Hezbollah still packs a powerful punch. I'll go further. I'll say to Mr. Netanyahu and his chorus of gangsters around the world, you ain't seen nothing yet. And I firmly believe that. I'm not starry-eyed about any liberation movements, prospects of success. It's not easy to fight and win a revolution. It's not easy to liberate your country. There is no easy walk to freedom, as Nelson Mandela told us on the front cover of his own memoirs. There is no easy walk to freedom. Sacrifices will always have to be made. There is no final victory. There is no final defeat. The struggle continues, and it will continue for a very long time, generation after generation. The idea that a leader like Nasrallah can be easily replaced is, of course, fanciful. It is comparable 
I saw this written earlier today. It is comparable to Stalin being killed in the early part of uh, Barbarossa, in the early part of the Second World War. If Stalin had been killed, it would have been a monumental Everestian blow to the morale of the Soviet Union and the leadership of that country, but the Soviet Union would still have prevailed. It would still have made it all the way to Berlin to crush the beast in his lair. That much I'm certain of. A leader like Nasrallah comes along once in a hundred years, maybe more than that. His cousin, Safi Adin, who is the new leader of Hezbollah, uh, is reportedly far more radical than uh, Hassan Nasrallah was, which is another lesson to chalk up on the blackboard when we're doing the accounting of this whole thing. I told people, I told Parliament a hundred times, make a deal with Arafat, because after Arafat comes the deluge. After Arafat comes people who you will not be able to make a deal with. Nobody listened. They killed Arafat. Nobody listened when they uh, killed uh, Rantisi, the former leader of Hamas. Did Hamas get weaker once his leader was, their leader were killed? No, they got stronger. They killed Ismail Haniya in Tehran, about which more later. Did that finish Hamas? Don't be stupid. Don't be ridiculous. This all stems from an Orientalist misunderestimation, as George W. Bush would put it, of the Muslim character. Now, don't get me wrong. If I'm not starry-eyed about liberation movements, I sure ain't starry-eyed about Muslims. There are two billion Muslims in the world. At least a billion of them are hypocrites. They care more for this life, this dunya, than for the judgment day. They use Islam to stay in power. They use Islam to enrich themselves. Or they use Islam to control their wives, to control their daughters, to impose a conservative lifestyle, at least on their families. A billion hypocrites in the Muslim Ummah. But there's another billion who are absolutely sincere, who love God more than they love life, who love their cause, their religion, their deen more than they love life, who believe in the judgment day, who believe that what counts, what matters is what happens on that judgment day. What is your destination once you have been judged? There's a billion of those. And they are in every Arab country. And they are Sunni and they are Shia. And they are being underestimated by Western commentators and Western political leaders. But I've got to tell you something else. Of the billion who are filled with sincerity and de class, in that regard at least, in their deep-seated belief that dishonor is worse than death, most of them are Shiites. That's the truth of it. That's why Iran is the only anti-imperialist country to have survived everything for 44 years. That's why Hezbollah has been able to grow from a few men to 100,000 men armed to the teeth, as Netanyahu will find out if his soldiers cross the border this evening, the Shiites are very deep believers and they love their martyrs with a passion which is visceral. It is sometimes quite difficult for the Western mind to handle, to see the adulation, to see the flagellation, to see Karbala in the full pilgrimage mode, to see the streets of Lebanon tonight as they mourn in the streets their slain leader, Hezbollah. Don't misunderestimate these people. You'd be a fool if you do. Sure, they killed 10, 12 commanders. Sure, they killed the supreme leader 
of the movement, of the organization. But they have made thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands more across the region and across the world. I've often said, when pe people ring me up here saying, are you not afraid you're going to be killed? I said, I'm not afraid of death. What matters is how you die, for what you die, and how many people come to pick up your microphone, your pen, your rifle, once you have fallen. And I mean that. And if I mean it, be sure that the people who support Hezbollah really, really mean it. So Hezbollah is not defeated. If you think that, you are a fool. And last night, and I'm sure again tonight, the full force of what the resistance has to offer Netanyahu will again be on display. But the shoe, which I'll grant you, has not yet dropped, is the Iranian shoe. There is a crescent. I called, I wrote about it in 1982 or three. I coined the phrase, a crescent of crisis, stretching from Iran all the way to the Levant. An axis of resistance which forms a crescent and which has powerful players within it. In Iraq, who have scarcely begun to speak, but if you're an American watching with a son in the American bases in Iraq, you have to do everything that you can to get your government to withdraw them before another Benghazi to the power of 10 occurs. In Yemen, who have proven themselves, not to me because I always knew it, but to others, the Yemenis are possibly pound for pound Though the poorest country in the world, possibly the best fighters in the whole world are the Yemenis. And they're proving it again in this war of attrition. Damascus was bombed today. We don't yet know the details. Just that it was a powerful explosion in the middle of Damascus. It may be that Netanyahu intends to open a Syrian front. In which case, again, he is underestimating not just the Syrians, but the resolve of their Russian allies. Russia will never abandon Syria. They've come too far. Russia was an ally of Syria for 54 years. They're not going to relinquish that position. They have military bases there. They have naval bases there, air force bases there. They have many troops there. And they have many anti-aircraft batteries of S-400s that can bring down every F-35 that Israel or the United States puts into the skies. Russia will fight for Syria. So if they intend to include Syria in their battle plans, they're again going to have a rude awakening. But the big shoe is the Iranian shoe. Some people are laughing at Iran's failure to respond. There's ample reason to believe that if Iran had responded after the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran, that Hassan Nasrallah might still be alive today because a new deterrence might have been established. But Iran will answer. And when Iran answers, then we've got a regional war. Stay tuned. This is the mother of all talk shows. Okay, so that was George Galloway. Uh, I think that covers everything. Um, anyway, I was going to put up a follow-up video by Douglas McGregor, but this video is so damn long. We'll cover that tomorrow or the next day, whenever I make another video. Peace out. Stay free.